Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are back. You got Hef here, your old pal Hef, your Chris Farley impersonator, here with the play-by-play. -play. I've got my color commentator, Noah. He is the cyber pet detective, Noah Ventura, right? That's what I'm going to call you, buddy. And we have some crazy top stories. Fascinating Word document was uploaded to a file scanning service last week. Researchers started looking at it, and they found out that it's a zero-day malicious code execution in office documents plus we got to talk about tail os users there's a zero day out there folks the digital driver's licenses they were hacked and we got to talk about that plus pre-jacking online accounts a new attack technique all that and more here on the security metrics news we are security metrics we are coming to you from the lodge here at the base of the silicon slopes our goal is to help you keep current on the changing threat landscape really help you take an intelligent approach to cybersecurity and help you get that peace of mind. And Noah, hit him with the tagline. Never have a false sense of security. Here we go. All right, Noah, this, uh, this story has been lighting up the headlines, man. Uh, Microsoft Zero Day, the attack underway. I like the name of it. It's called Felina, which is named after a area code in a village in Italy, the Felina village in Italy. I love yeah. that name, but we got to talk about the zero day and how it's impacting the world. It's absolutely mind blowing how this came about and this vulnerability. Uh, let's first talk about where it's found. It's found in the MSDT, which is the Microsoft support diagnostic tool. What is that tool actually used for? So this uh, vulnerability happens when a word document has a template on it. And that template is able to call HTML um, from a remote resource. Okay. So they, the researchers were able to see that um, this document had code in it that used MSDT and was then able to execute PowerShell scripts on the host. And this is especially concerning because the document doesn't even need to be opened. It just needs to be previewed. And then that code is run because your Microsoft Word calls that template, gets the code, runs it. Fascinating stuff because this vulnerability, it impacts every version of Office that's out there from 2013, yep. 2019, 2021, Office 365, Office Pro Plus. I mean, it hits everything. And it's absolutely mind-blowing in that how this code actually takes place. Um, executing arbitrary code on Windows systems, absolutely nutty. I think what's interesting, though, the, the most fascinating part of the story, Noah, is the controversy behind this and mm -hmm. the delayed response from Microsoft because this is not the first time that Microsoft was made aware of this thing oh, happening. Oh, really? Wow. Actually, it was it was found back in April, and this security researcher who goes by the name of Crazy Man, he said, <laughs> "I found this thing, and uh, yeah, I you know you guys need to be aware of this." And at the time, Microsoft said something like, "Well, it's not that big of a deal, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put out a little advisory about it, but nothing to worry about." And now, all of a sudden, the crap has hit the fan, and this thing has just exploded the last week or so that it's been found in the wild. So how do you stop it, I guess is the question. Because what is Microsoft recommending right now? They're recommending that you don't use this MSDT protocol at all. You block it on your firewall and go from there. Yeah, which really, it's going to kind of be tough for some companies that depend on some of these features in the MSD, uh, MSDT protocol. So uh, tough, tough stuff, folks. This is something you want to be aware of. It's uh, It's just blowing up the web and we'll keep you posted as we get updates on how you're going to mitigate it and if there's patching available as of as of right now that is not available at the time of this recording so there you go that's what's happening out there we do have other top stories to get to and this top story is one that i did miss and i'm glad you brought it to my attention this morning i totally totally missed this i don't know how i did but tails os users are advised not to use the tor browser until a firefox bug is patched i guess we kind of need to explain what tails is first and then we can kind of get into what's actually happening with this so what is tails so tails is a privacy focused operating system and the way that it works is you load it onto a USB drive, 
plug it into a computer, uh, you boot up into Tails, and everything is supposed to be anonymous. It uses Tor, which is the Onion router, yep. and this is a anonymized uh, internet browsing service that also lets you access like the uh, deep web. And the like the key selling point of Tails is this anonymous. Anonymity. Yep. Uh, as soon as you turn off the computer, everything is deleted, so that there's no traces left. But with this vulnerability, um, there's a JavaScript vulnerability with a remote code execution. So you kind of lose um, that uh, privacy that you're trying to get with Tails. Yeah, people love and their privacy. And the Tails project, it, it's actually an acronym, folks. And the acronym stands for the Amnesiac Cognito live system. That's a mouthful of words for me, man. Uh, but yeah, this uh, this this Linux-based system is really aimed at privacy. But the challenge is, what do you do now that the zero day is out there? Uh, how? What's the recommendation steps? Disable JavaScript. Which, if you're somebody who's really focused in privacy, you've probably done that already. Yeah. So. Another alternative is to just stop using Tails altogether until a new release comes out, and that is one one pathway you can take as well. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is uh, well, again, we'll keep you up to date on this. So again, two huge zero days in the past week, and throughout the whole year, we've had a ton of zero days. I think I've counted something like eight or nine since May of this this past year. Uh, just a huge number of zero days, that, and they they keep growing. So, and then another important thing on this is that it is also a bug in Firefox. Yeah. So if you're using Firefox, which a lot of people do, yeah, turn off JavaScript as well. <laughs> and this vulnerability came from Pwn to Own. Yeah, have you heard of Pwn to yeah, Own? We, have? Yeah, we talked about awesome. all the time. Yeah, the Super Bowl of bug bounty. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right, we got a couple other stories to get to, and the digital driver's license. I love. <laughs> I love the digital driver's license. I actually have one, folks. I'm not ashamed to admit it. And I always I got it because I wanted to study the vulnerabilities in it. And I've done a lot of that. But it's nice to finally feel like I, I feel like I've been vindicated that I've said all along there has been flaws in this digital driver's license. The rollout has been international. It's not just the United States that has them, but Australia as well. And in states like Colorado, Hawaii, Mississippi, Ohio, Puerto Rico, Connecticut, Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Oklahoma, and we here in Utah, we have digital driver's licenses. Very, very popular. A lot of states are are taking them on. What is a digital driver's license? We should really explain that first. Yeah, so a digital driver's license is just a copy of your driver's license that you can present to the police on your phone. Yeah, and it's not just the police that'll accept it. In Utah, for example, some banks accept it. There is some stores, grocery stores here in town that accept it. So it's growing in popularity. Uh, essentially, what you have is you have an app on your phone and you show your proof of identity uh, when you get pulled over, for example. So what's interesting though about this story is that some security researchers were out there and they figured out that you could actually forge a fake identity using a digital driver's license. And what, what people are doing, especially in Australia, kids are actually using it to basically uh, get alcohol, drink underage, or you know use fake uh, date of birth for fraudsters. Uh, pretty crazy stuff, man. Yeah, definitely. Got to implement some security on that. Yeah, and that's the problem right now, folks. So what what happens is if your QR code that's attached to your digital driver's license gets scanned, then there's a potential for fraud there. And a lot of people don't even know that they've been fraud. You don't even realize it that you've been scammed uh, because you know it's it's so hard to detect this. But that's the challenge for these vendors that are releasing these digital driver's licenses. There's so many security flaws associated with this. And the promise that was made to all of us was, you're going to have a digital driver's license, Noah, and it's going to be secure. I mean, how many times have we heard that? And it, that promise doesn't come true at all. Yeah, I think it'll be a while before I get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it, folks. Digital driver's licenses can be forged right now. Another couple stories that we got to talk about is a new hacking technique. And they're calling this, researchers are calling this a new class of attacks. They call it pre-hijack your online account. Pre-hijacking your online account. Can you kind of explain what, what's going on here, Noah? Yeah, so I guess the attackers are identifying which services you might 
want to register with in the future with your email. And they're using that information to um, get into the account before you've even made it. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, that sounds about right. What's interesting, Noah, that I find about this story is the attacker is, it has to get out there and try to predict what service you're going to use, right? So let's just say I want to attack you. I'm going to create a Facebook account because I know you don't use Facebook. And that is my, my thought process is I'm going to try to pre-hijack that account before you register your own Facebook site. Uh, what's interesting too is there are five different types of pre-hijacking attack methods. So it's very deep in where this new new class of attacks is going. This technique is very interesting. We're going to keep you updated as well as this thing changes and and takes off. I predict Noah that you're going to see a lot more of this type of stuff. Oh yeah. I I don't know if I would call it though a new class of attacks. I mean, hackers have always done this where you know they they see a famous celebrity. That celebrity doesn't have a Twitter account. I'm going to create the Twitter account. And then what you see is the celebrity comes back in and says, I'm the real Kim Kardashian, right? I'm the real yeah. Donald Trump, man. Uh, so I don't know, man. I don't know if I'd call this a new class of attack. But they are saying that there are five different types of pre-hijacking attack methods. And it's interesting stuff from our perspective. All right. Got a couple other attack, uh, a couple other stories to get to here. Uh, you know, I used to always say, no, I'm going to just Google it, right? I'm going to Google my information. But now I'm in this habit, Noah, of saying like, I'm going to duck, duck, go it. You know, you should duck, duck, go this topic, right? But duck, duck, go is in super hot water. Uh, what's what's kind of going on there with this hidden tracking agreement? Oh, yeah. So both of us uh, living here in Utah, we th we have some billboards for DuckDuckGo. All over the place. And one of them says something like, um, increase your privacy, use DuckDuckGo. Yep. The other one says, um, here's to you, whoever you are. And there's like a person with a blurred out face kind of implying that the service gives you anonymity online. Yep. And the selling point of DuckDuckGo is that it is supposed to be anonymous or more private, which um, unfortunately with these types of services, it never seems to be the case. No. And with DuckDuckGo recently, um, someone has found out that they are enabling trackers from Microsoft within their uh, browser. But they're not, but they are blocking others though. And that's yep. where the controversy that's comes That's the play. controversy because they're blocking Apple and Facebook. And Google. And Google. Yeah, yeah. they're being blocked and Microsoft is being allowed to run uh, I'll tell you, man, this is going to blow up on them <laughs> if they don't they get got, a handle on this. Yeah, they made this agreement with Microsoft, and it, it kind of turned around and bit them. Yeah. I don't know why they thought no one would find out about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, watch me pull yeah. a rabbit out of my hat, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, this is something else. It's been a wild week for cybersecurity, and stories like this and stories like the fake driver's licenses, just it, it just catches my eye. and. Uh, I'll tell you, folks, we'll, uh, we'll again, we'll keep track of this story as well. But I do not think this is going to go very well for DuckDuckGo. No. But if you're not familiar with DuckDuckGo, just DuckDuck and go it and Google it, right? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Let's get on with another story here. Phishing attacks, man. Uh, they're on the rise. Uh, no surprise there. 54% jump in quarter one, according to the Kroll researchers. They said that... Over the same period last year, it's a 54% increase. A lot of the activity is tied to Emotet and Iced ID malware. And really, threat actors have just been using both simultaneously to try to drop malware out there. A lot of trend lines, a lot of lessons learned here to take away. What I thought was interesting, Noah, is two examples they gave in the article, mm -hmm. two specific trends. One trend that is out there is threat actors are breaking into a network. They're exploiting, for example, vulnerability then they're getting in there to launch convincing phishing campaigns from inside the company. All right. Now that's, that's pretty dangerous when you think about that. Most people that get phishing emails, they get it from outside the company. Yep. But what the threat actors here are able to do is get in, get the, the global admin credentials from example, like an IT employee that works for the company or a, a C level C suite person. And then they take those creds, they send out targeted, spear phishing emails from inside the company to try to download sensitive data. Pretty fascinating attack, man. Yeah, great. Clever way to move laterally within an organization if you're a pen tester. Yeah, and you think about it as a threat actor, you're going to, when you get that email from the threat actor, you're going to think it's legit because it came from inside the company and not from outside. So. Yep. Uh, interesting stuff, but there are some other stories regarding phishing and we want to talk about some of those, those trends as well, including a new way, hackers have found this new way to smuggle malware onto your device and they're doing it 
basically through PDFs, right? And no, nobody ever sus suspects a PDF file to be malicious, right, man? I think I, by default, ex <laughs> expect PDFs to be malicious. Like, who would send me a PDF? What, yeah. Yeah, why? Why? Are you still get PDFs? Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm shocked about that. But uh, what, uh, what the threat actors are doing here is they're sending a subject line that says remittance invoice to you, and it's tricking the victims thinking that they'll be getting paid for something. And really what it is, it's a Word document, right? Yep. And then that Word document, the title says, has been verified. And that, my friends, is the trick. Because the threat actor is saying, this has been verified. This PDF has been verified. This Word document has been verified. But, uh-uh, it really hasn't. And that is where you know people think, well, I got this, this PDF and it says it's been verified. I'm good to go. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no ma malicious macros inserted into any of these documents. But the reality is that's not what's actually happening. So you feel like you get this phishing email, you're reassured that everything is good to go. And the reality is the bad guy's getting in there and they're distributing uh, key logging software like Snake, Snake Key Logger. And uh, that's how they're taking advantage of it. So, But uh, dangerous stuff, man, because that, uh, that Word file... It comes with that macro. It's already enabled. It starts automatically running, and it starts trying to download the, the key logging software. So nasty stuff. What keeps you up at night? Do chat bots keep you up at night? Oh, yeah. Phishing chat box? That's crazy. Man, Phishing chat guys, bots? Phishing chat bots. You believe this? <laughs> the threat actors are setting up the infrastructure, folks, for chat bots. You guys know what chat bots are, right? You want to try to explain what a chat bot is? Because yeah. I'm sure you used one. So I'm sure you've gone onto a car dealership's website or you've tried to contact support and they've said, hello, how can I help you today? And then res you respond like, oh, I need help with this, this. And it's like, we identified the keyword uh, internet and <laughs> right, right. you click this link. This might solve your problem. And like, that's usually a chat bot. And it's, it's not a, a real person. It's I mean, an it's automated scripts. system. Yeah, right. that scripts. follows a script. Yep, they're pre-programmed. And pre -programmed. it responds to you. It's meant to seem like a person and uh, cut down on the number of human employees that they have to have sitting behind computers. But the threat actors are now using fake chatbots yep. to try to establish a conversation with you, the victim. So here it is. You get this phishing email, right? And let's just say it's from FedEx or DHL because that's who's using it right now. Uh, the, the threat actors are posing as DHL or FedEx and they're saying, hey, it's time. Uh, would you like to start up a conversation? You open up the chatbot and it starts asking you for information like, hey, you need to fix your delivery. Uh, you, you, this delivery is not going to happen unless you fix it. We need you to confirm it. Give us your address. We're going to give you the tracking number. They even give the people, no, they give them a fake CAPTCHA. So it makes it seem like so legit in this That's pretty clever. Bot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then you got to, you basically have to enter your credentials, your credit card information, all that stuff gets promptly harvested. And the next thing you know is you've been fished. So fascinating target. Um, and it's it's really brilliant on the part of the threat actors, but that's where you need to be extra vigilant in your own world. Make sure your employees mm -hmm. know that sometimes these chatbots are not legit, and they need to be really aware of of what's going on out there. How these phishing these phishing tactics now using chatbots, fake chatbots, fascinating stuff, man. All right, got a couple more stories to go over with you. We talked about Conti before. Do you remember Conti? Oh, yeah. Big ransomware group, lots of high-profile targets, and then they broke up. Yeah, the right? band broke up, man. But is the band getting back together? I think the band's starting their own band. I think is they that are. right? <laughs> yeah. Their new chapter in the world of Conti. And, and Noah, this is one of your – I know you like talking about these ransomware groups. Conti, the brand – uh, their negotiation site, their chat rooms, their messenger service, their mm -hmm. servers, their proxy hosts, all shutting down. But does that actually mean they're retiring is the question. There, no way. No way, man. No way. They're going to follow the money. The cybercrime landscape changes. And that's the thing about Conti and all these ransomware groups. When they say they, or they claim they're shutting down, their influence, their talent, it's all still out there for mm -hmm. the world to see. And I think that's what's interesting about the Conti Ransomware Group, their website. Uh, they actually, it's gone right now. It's offline. And But there's more to the story, Noah, than we're hearing. And the place that we got to go is down to South America. So take a trip with me down to South America, Noah, because what's happening down there right now? So I guess there's a ransomware group claiming they're going to overthrow right. the Costa Rican government if they don't pay a ransom. 
And what's that ransom demand? Isn't it like $20 million? $20 million. <laughs> to the to the, the country of Costa Rica. And Costa Rica, folks, is in some serious trouble right now. The, this high-profile attack, and there's, <laughs> they're saying that Conti is still behind this. So even though Conti claims they've shut down, this is kind of a weird, I, I don't want to call it a distraction, but if you're going to you know kill off your brand, right, and you're mm-hmm. going to do this, is it like one final score, like one final attempt, Noah, to go, we'll go after Costa Rica, right? Easy, low pickings. <laughs> that's what they're thinking. And here it is, $20 million demand. All, a lot of their government agencies are offline still. So wow. if, you're, if you're planning a summer trip, a summer vacation down to Costa Rica, you may want to think twice. I'm not a great travel agent. I just I play one on TV. I got to tell you, folks, you may want to think twice about going down there. Conte is still issuing comments about this incident uh, as of last Friday. Uh, boy, it is just uh, it's just crazy how how these ransomware groups, you know, they open up, they make their money, then they shut down and then they rebrand and they keep doing it yeah. over and over and over. Oh, again. yeah. It's all these same guys over and over again, all no matter what uh, name they're under. It's a lot of the same people. It is, man. Uh, one other story that we're going to talk about before we we wrap up this and go to the data breaches section. Uh, I thought this was interesting, Noah, that water companies are ransom. I'm sorry. Let me let me say this right. Insurance companies are increasingly saying we are not going to insure water companies. Why? Due to ransomware, because they're a critical infrastructure. That's a prime target for these ransomware operators. Their insurance is saying, hey, we don't want to insure you from uh, ransomware anymore. Yeah, fascinating stuff. So basically, a water company is uninsurable. And for a company to not be able to be insured, it's absolutely mind-blowing that uh, these these government agencies, like the water company, for example, how important is water infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and they can't have insurance against a ransomware attack? All right, Foxconn. What is Foxconn? They got breach, man. What are they famous for? Because I, I people have to have heard that term before. Be- besides people protesting at Foxconn overseas, what are they known for, Noah? Do you know? No, I, I don't. They I make don't Apple know. iPhones, man. They make oh. iPhones. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the deal with Foxconn, folks. Baja, California, their location there got popped. This is a... Uh, in the city of Tijuana, and they this particular factory. Now, Foxconn makes all types of different things, not just iPhones, but they actually make medical devices, consumer electronics, uh, all kinds of stuff with industrial operations. 5,000 people work in this facility in, in Baja, California. And the LockBit 2.0 ransomware group got them. Uh, do, you, do you remember what LockBit is fam- famous for? No, other than having this really cool ransom note, honestly. <laughs> Fog, uh, Lockbit is the guys that were behind the Bridgestone breach from, uh, I believe, last year. So they are right now holding for ransom the Foxconn factory. Uh, I, I've seen all kinds of stories behind this that their factory is back online, that they're not paying. But who knows? As of right now, June 11th is their deadline to pay, Foxconn's deadline to pay Lockbit ransomware group their, their ransom demands. Uh, the, it's interesting, too, that Foxconn, they're always being targeted, Noah. Uh, if you recall, it was the Doppelpamer group that got them in December of 2020. They oh, attacked, wow. Yeah, they attacked the, some U.S. systems of, of part, as part of Foxconn. So what I, the lesson learned for us, though, and you know we're in the loop, obviously, about the indicators of compromise for Lockbit. That these, this information was already released. Like the FBI gave us the IOCs for Lockbit. How do you, I mean, we know how to find Lockbit. We know how to stop Lockbit in a client's environment, mm-hmm. yet Foxconn gets hit with it. Uh, to me, it just seems, honestly, really no, no excuses here, man. When the FBI has given you the IOCs for Lockbit and Doppelpamer and all these other ransomware groups, you have to take advantage of that information get it into your security system and your platform or hire a group like security metrics to come in there and find the bad guys for you. So, all right, Noah, let's talk about this one too. Indian airlines uh, named spice jet. You ever flown on spice jet? I haven't. That, no. <laughs> all, all over that part of the country are these like small, I don't want to call them startup airlines, but they're low cost airlines. Okay. So it's like the spirit Airlines or Frontier Airlines of India, yes, right? that's it, man. They got hit with a ransomware attack. And I'm always fascinated when airlines get hit with ransomware attacks, uh, especially when it disrupts the the flow of the airline. Now, I'm not this does not appeal to the shot and Freud in me, man. All right. But what it does appeal to me on is the whole, like, just disruption 
and the amount of people that depend on these airlines and they can't use them. Yeah, it's a major bummer. And people were saying they were stuck on their plane for five hours. Yeah. Waiting for the computers to come online that would, I guess, let them off. <laughs> so something like a server was down. They didn't they weren't able to get the fuel systems started, all that kind of stuff. Oh, crazy. But I gotta tell you, folks, I, I this these kind of stories blow my mind when they happen, especially to an airline, which is really any airline, uh, not just the ones in the United States, but you're talking about critical infrastructure again being attacked, being held for ransom. Uh, unbelievable that in this day and age that these things are still hitting this critical infrastructure. Okay, got a couple other stories to talk about too. 3.6 million MySQL servers were found exposed online by some researchers. Can you kind of walk us through what's happening here? Yeah, so some researchers scan the internet. They're looking for uh, MySQL servers that are exposed to the internet. Like anybody could access them and try to log on. And they found 3.6 million. Woo-hoo. That's a lot. Now, a lot of those are probably things like somebody's senior project in their computer science class. But a decent number of these have to be important information. Yeah. I imagine a lot of universities data, a lot of government data in there. But you're talking about in the United States was the number one location for all of these exposed (laughs) SQL servers. 740,000, followed by China in second place with 296,000. What is the lesson learned here? for a company, any size business with their SQL server. So you gotta follow best practices whenever you're setting up a service like this. You wanna disable remote access to your database server. Uh, You want to delete users, give the server the right amount of privileges. Uh, Make sure that um, you're not counted among those 3.6 million. Yeah, absolutely. That external attack surface is an area that you want to get a handle on. It's an area that we preach all about with our clients. Getting a handle on that, what's out there, what's exposed is so critical, folks. All right, got a couple other stories to go after here. And this one got my attention. This happened about a week or so ago. Zola, which is a wedding registry company, that got hit with a cyber attack. And this one is heartbreaking in that approximately 3,000 accounts were compromised. And a lot of people were on Reddit. And that's where I was getting a lot of my information from. I saw that too, yeah. Yeah, that they were saying, hey, uh, I, I had all my gift cards and my monetary gifts all in my wed- wed- wedding registry. And they're all poof, gone. So sad. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Man, imagine brides and you know people planning their honeymoons and stuff. And then that money's gone. But the worst part of the story is how Zola reacts. And I think that's, folks, that's the lesson learned here. When you do get breached, you don't hide it. You, even if you don't have all the information out there, when you're starting to get reports like this on Reddit from users, your users are claiming they are seeing their data being breached and you're not responding to it. I think that's just as bad, Noah, as 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 ignoring the issue completely. And that's what Zola did here. Uh, there were some posts out there. We'll put up a, an image right here. Um, th- some of the some of the posts that people put on Reddit. This happened to me. They transferred four hundred fifty dollars in honeymoon funds. <sighs> they purchased another five hundred dollars in gift cards. This guy or this lady, Lily Moss, four thousand dollars. I'm out four thousand dollars and not heard a peep from anyone at Zola. Uh, another person says, "Well, my account got hacked today too. They charged six hundred fifty dollars in gift cards and they stole a thousand dollars." Gosh, folks, I mean, getting married can be stressful. And then to have this icing on top of the cake is just heartbreaking for these people. This is an excellent area, Noah, where Security Metrics has some great tools in here that we could have potentially stopped this kind of breach. Uh, Again, heartbreaking. Let's talk about one more thing, too. GitHub, 100,000 NPM users' credentials stolen in that April attack. Do you remember that? I think we talked about that April attack. Yeah, I think we did, yeah. Can you kind of summarize exactly what happened here? Because there's some updated news. We actually got an update about what actually happened in this OAuth uh, token attack. Yeah, so I guess um, these attackers got OAuth tokens from GitHub, and they were able to use those stolen tokens to gain access to the user's GitHub repos, which is where uh, the code that they're writing is stored. And they're able to uh, download this... uh, source code from a number of different organizations yeah the threat actors the update comes from this this piece the threat actors actually got 
access to the AWS API key. And once you have that, man. That's keys to the kingdom. <laughs> that's the keys to the right kingdom. There. So, folks, lesson learned here. You got to secure anything that you have in the cloud. Uh, and what's really cool now is a lot of these cloud providers like Amazon, they're automatically defaulting to all the highest security settings you can do. But for some reason, some uh, some folks are out there and they, they change those settings. So, again, get a lockdown on anything that you have going to the cloud and make sure that stuff is secure especially your api keys so it, fascinating stuff so we got a couple other things the gaslighting segment i know you love this this is our last segment of the of the <laughs> presentation here uh I, I call it gaslighting in that the justice department is now softening their enforcement of the hacking law um what they're saying is what noah so we in the u.s we have the cfaa computer fraud and abuse act and it is extremely vague and it's used to prosecute tons and tons of different computer related crimes and even some things that maybe you wouldn't really consider a crime but it is under the CFAA. Yeah. And that's where this um statement is coming from. Yeah. Is that they are changing the language I suppose to soften the enforcement of the law against people who are like Hacking in good faith. Yeah. So we're talking about here legit pen testers yeah. that are saying, I'm going to find a vulnerability in your company or in your business. And the Justice Department now is saying, well, you know, you are a legit pen tester. We are going to do our due diligence and we're not going to prosecute. If you are le doing legit pen testing and you're doing it in good faith. Uh, yeah. And that's the challenge, though, is proving that you're doing it in good faith, yeah. that you're not doing it maliciously. I mean, really, it's on the, the onus of the security researcher to be open and honest and candid and right up front, hey, I'm a security researcher. I'm looking for a vulnerability. I found something. I want to share mm -hmm. it with you. Please don't come after me. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think this does nearly enough, but it's definitely a great step in the right direction. Yeah. So. Big time. Big time. All right, folks. So again, we are Security Metrics. Thanks for watching. I hope you had a good time. Uh, thanks for dealing with our... our uh, we were just fired up today, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you like us, please subscribe. Leave a note in the comments. Talk to us. We love communicating with all of you. And of course, hit the bell icon if you want to get notified when we upload a new episode about every week or so. Every week and a half, we upload a new episode. And again, I'm Hef. I'm Noah. Thanks for watching.